I have to start by admitting that not every day of mine is a good day. I have a vivid memory of one particular day. It was early in my career at McKinsey, and it was my first shot at presenting to the board. And so this was quite exciting. Also, I felt quite nervous, but I knew I wanted to project gravitas, presence. And so I was mostly doing this by striding about as boldly as I could. And in my mind, at least, I was owning the room. I'd even thought ahead and looked down and checked that the cables weren't going to trip me up. <laughs> what happened next, I had not expected or planned for, though, which was, as I was taking an especially bold step into the middle of the room, I heard this crack. <laughs> yeah, and some of you will know what happened then. <laughs> And it turns out that it is possible for a heel to completely shear off your shoe. And then, as I was lying on the ground, <laughs> it turns out that it was pretty impossible to project any further <laughs> gravitas or presence. So there are days like that. There are days when you have wardrobe malfunctions, technology glitches. But I'm interested in a philosophy which I call re realistic optimism, which is to say, not to pretend that everything is amazing and that if you just say everything is awesome enough that it will be, but to say, let's acknowledge the constraints and then let's look for the wiggle room within and around those constraints. And for me, behavioral science has always been the toolbox that I've turned to for that. Because insights into how the brain works and insights into how we and why we think, feel and behave the way we do coming out of the more behavioral corners of economics, psychology, and neuroscience. Well, this is a trove, because if we understand just a little about those things, it gives us so much more control over things that actually seem quite random, and that we assume are random. Well, you all know that there are days when you are firing on all cylinders, and days when you're not. So I remember a day when I was getting qualified to be a coach. I was on this course. It was a strange mix of bittersweet because I was doing the course because I was working a lot with senior teams and I thought, I thought it was really wise for me to actually get a certification to make sure that I wasn't doing anything dangerous with these people. You know, I did it just as an add-on to my work, but then I loved it. I loved it so much. I want to be a coach. But I was a partner at McKinsey, and McKinsey's not a coaching firm. I like my friends. It's a wonderful, I've been there years. I want to be a coach. And I was really stuck with this career dilemma. I was really worried that I was going to have to quit, but I didn't really want to. And when you're doing a, a course, like a coaching course, the idea is that you practice on each other so that you get better at, obviously, improving the way that someone else is feeling and thinking. And so I was sitting with uh, a woman named Jill who was helping me, uh, help, helping to develop her skills by coaching me on a real topic. So I thought, well, you know, this is the real topic in my life right now. And then she said, OK, Caroline, now, let's set that aside for a moment. Tell me what the ideal situation is. And at first I was still, so if I knew the ideal, I can't get to the ideal, the ideal doesn't exist. And she said, no, no, just, don't, just tell me what the ideal actually is. Which the ideal was obviously to be a, a coach at McKinsey. So I explained what I thought that might look like. And then she said, well, what's the first step towards that? I, I said, oh, well, it's obviously to tell everybody that that's what I want to do. Because who knows, there might be opportunities that come up. It seems blindingly obvious, and I know you're looking at me saying, why didn't I think of that before? The reason I didn't think of it before was because... When your brain senses any kind of threat, it puts you on the defensive. Some of you might have heard of the phrase fight or flight. Yeah? So we have this deeply instinctive reaction to anything that hits us as a threat. We either fight, which might be snap, or it might be flight, which is keep our head down or freeze, actually, and wait and see what's going on. So we have this instinctive reaction when we're feeling defensive against any kind of threat. And the two things you need to know about this are that, first of all, it takes n almost nothing to trigger this reaction. Even a, a frowning face can do it. Certainly a difficult task where it's 
not clear what the answer is. Second thing you need to know is that when you're in defensive mode, your brain is not putting as much energy into the conscious, clever, reasoning part of your brain. It's diverting energy towards keeping you safe. You can see this on brain scans, that there's less activation in the prefrontal cortex when people are feeling <laughs> even mildly stressed. So, why was I suddenly able to see the answer or see a way forward when Jill said, yeah, but what's the ideal, Caroline, and how do you get there? It's because she was taking me out of a defensive space and putting me into what I call discovery mode, you know, where you're actually you're thinking about what the ideal might be and you're thinking about how to get there. Or you're thinking about when have we succeeded in this in the past and how do, what do we learn from that and how do we apply that to this task now. It doesn't mean you don't think about the problems. But if you can do it when you're not having your brain on defensive mode, then you're able to access more of your full intelligence. You can't actually make yourself more intelligent, really, than you are um, at the best of times. But you can certainly put yourself into a place where you're as smart as you know you can be. I think that that's a pretty good recipe for a good day. <laughs>